Thanks a lot for uh, coming this morning. I'm Seth Ammerman. I'm a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist and an addiction medicine doc at Stanford University at the Children's Hospital. I also run a program called the Teen Health Van, which is a community outreach program at the Children's Hospital, which provides free health care to homeless and uninsured youth in different neighborhoods from San Francisco to San Jose. And I work a lot with underserved youth, and as you know, they often have substance use issues. What I'm going to talk about this morning is how to counsel parents and teens about marijuana in this era of legalization. I want to keep this casual, so as I go through the talk, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your, your hands and we can take questions as we go through the talk, although there will be time at the end as well. So, okay. There are four topics I'm going to cover this morning. The first is the current epidemiology of marijuana use. I know that some other talks have covered these topics, but in case you have not been at them or just uh, want some clarification. The second topic is going to be concerning the use of medical marijuana in the pediatric and adolescent populations versus adult populations. The third topic will be adverse outcomes of regular and heavy use specifically of recreational marijuana by adolescents. And finally, I'll be talking specifically, uh, giving you counseling points for both parents and teens. So, in terms of the current epidemiology, there are three databases in the United States that have followed substance use issues for quite a while. The first is called Monitoring the Future, which is a collaboration between the University of Michigan and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And this is an annual survey that started around 1975, so we have over 40 years worth of longitudinal data here. And they survey approximately 50,000 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students. So this is a student-based sample, and this is actually the one I'm going to be focusing on. Although I think all these databases are useful. The second one is the Youth <clears throat> Risk Behavior Survey, which is a collaboration for, between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, <clears throat> uh, and includes national, state, territorial, tribal governments, and these are local school-based surveys. Uh, of ninth through 12th grade students. This is every two years. And then there's NISDA, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which is through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This is an annual survey. It's household-based, and there's approximately 70,000 randomly selected individuals age 12 and older. Now, one reason I want you to know about these is because uh, they're obviously different samples. You have school-based, youth risk particularly focuses on more local issues, and NISDA's household. And one interesting thing I've learned at this conference is that people use these different databases for different reasons whether they're pro-marijuana or anti-marijuana. Uh, some say, well, the national data show this. Some say, well, the local data show that. And all it would say is, I, I, I think they're all, all legitimate, 
Uh, but when you're really looking at what's going on in your town or community, or you want to know what's going on in your state, uh, be sure you're, you're, you're uh, accessing all of them on, on, in one hand, because different uh, uh, data will be shown depending upon which database you use, and it may be more or less relevant to your particular situation. But they're all great. <laughs> now, I'm going to focus on monitoring the future. Again, we have over 40 years worth of data from monitoring the future. This is, these are the latest data. It's from last year, 2016. And they look at, at different levels of use. So I'm going to start now with lifetime prevalence. Monitoring the future asked, asked the question, have you ever used this substance at least once? And if you look at any illicit drug here, you can see that eighth graders, about 17% of eighth graders, so we're talking about 14 year olds by and large, this is national sample, have used an illicit drug. It goes up to almost half of 12th graders have. Now, I'm, uh, in my slides here, I'm only using drugs that are used at least by 10% of the youth population. So it's, if it's less than 10%, I'm not including it, although monitoring the future lists every single drug virtually uh, and alcohol and tobacco. But I want to focus on those that are more commonly used here. Alcohol is number one, and by the way, these are 12th grade rankings that are used at least by 10% of 12th graders. So the top blue one, alcohol is number one by 12th graders. Almost two thirds have ever used alcohol. Number two is marijuana, 44%. What's really of concern to me, a, a new concern are electronic vaporizers. They are going way up. And I'll have some more data on that, but they're actually number three. Uh, any prescription drugs is number four at 18%, and amphetamines are, are number five at 10%. The prescription now, drugs are used off-label or... Yes, this is, quote, misuse of prescription drugs or not as prescribed. So almost one in five uh, 12th graders have ever misused a prescription drug. Now, if you go down each column, Flavored alcoholic drinks have been used by more than half of adolescents ever, 12th graders. And these clearly are being targeted to kids. We know that from a lot of research at the alcohol industry. Uh, and by the way, the vape industry now uh, has a lot of flavored products to, to appeal to adolescents. What's concerning me is the bottom one on alcohol as well is that almost a half of all 12th graders have been drunk at least once. Now, in terms of marijuana, uh, about half of the adult population has ever tried it, about 125 million adults in the United States. Uh, in terms of cigarettes, that use has gone down, fortunately due, I think, to fantastic public health campaigns. But again, vaporizer use has gone up. Smoke was tobacco, which you see about 15%. That's a very regional sort of issue. It's much more common in the Midwest and the South, but rural areas definitely more than urban. Now, the next thing that Monitoring the Future asks about, are you a current user of any drug or alcohol or tobacco? Current use is defined as have you used it at least once in the past 30 days? Now, current use is important because of me as a pediatrician, and we, we who work in, in, in uh, offices and see kids regularly, these are the kids who now are experimenting. But the issue with this is they may go on to more regular and heavy use and develop problem use. So this, from my point of view, is a time we have to intervene when we see a kid in the office. So, if you look at current use, and I'll just, again, focus on 12th graders here. The, the numbers, are the, the percents are pretty much the same. Alcohol's number one, marijuana number two, although actually prescription drugs beat out vaporizers 
for current use. Amphetamines remain at the 10% mark. Again, flavored alcoholic drinks are common. Now we're looking at about 25% of, of 12th graders who have ever used an illicit drug currently. Again, of concern, one in five adolescents say, 12th graders say they've been drunk in the past month, at least once. Um, and vapes, again, beat out cigarettes here. Now, current users, as I mentioned, may be at risk of developing regular or heavy use. The one thing I want to point out is there's one drug that's more commonly used by younger kids, which are inhalants. They are most commonly used by eighth graders. Why? Well, they're around the house, they're easy to get. And once you get into 10th and 12th grade, you have access to the better stuff. So you're going to give up inhalants and go for things like alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. All other drugs except inhalants goes up with age in these yeah. samples. Now, daily use, which basically is, means you've got, as an adolescent, a problem. If you're a daily user and you're a teenager, you, you've likely got a problem use. So, again, alcohol's number one, marijuana number two, and cigarettes number three. Now, I want to point out, um, these percents seem rather low, but I'm going to point out some numbers at the next slide to show that even though, oh, well, let's say, now this is called binge drinking. That's defined as five or more drinks in the past, five or more drinks at a time. The question is, have you had five or more drinks in the past two weeks? Almost one in five 12th graders have said they had. Um, and uh, so that's binge, but daily any alcohol is one, a little over 1%, been drunk a little less than one. 6% of 12th graders are using marijuana every day in this sample. Again, cigarettes are almost 5%, and there does seem to be a relationship between cigarette use, vape use, and marijuana use. Now, I want to get to NISDA, one slide here. This is, have you in the past month used these, or misuse, they call it. So if you look at the percents, they look pretty reassuring, right? Uh, of pain relievers, the big opioid epidemic that we know is going on across the country. Let's say if you're 12 to 17, 1%. If you're a young adult, we call young adult 18 to 25 years old, two and a half percent. But if you look at the numbers, we're talking over a million users here, which is, I think, a major issue. And so you look at all these, we're talking about millions of kids who are using these drugs and may end up developing problem use. Now, I'm going to move on now from the epidemiology to the issues here. Now, you all probably know that marijuana is a Schedule I drug. By definition, a Schedule I drug by the DEA and Congress, because it's actually Congress that, who, that does the scheduling, it's highly dangerous, highly addictive, and has no medical indication. Marijuana is a Schedule I drug. I would add that LSD is a Schedule I drug, heroin is a Schedule I drug. Um, opioids, by the way, are Schedule II and III. Benzos are Schedule IV, by and large. If you're a Schedule I drug, it's very difficult to do research uh, in this country on marijuana. And actually, most of the research on marijuana comes not from the United States, but from Canada, uh, the Netherlands, and Israel. Uh, South Africa also has a fair amount of research on it. But in terms of actually formal research, for adults, there has been shown that there are four conditions that are helpful with medical marijuana, and those include chronic neuropathic pain, post-chemotherapy nausea and vomiting, muscle spasticity, and cachexia. 
Now, one of the problems, however, with uh, the use of marijuana uh, in these conditions when for patients is that when they go to a dispensary to get it, so I'm not talking about the research per se, but I had one of these conditions, or by the way, in California, which was the first medical marijuana state in 1996, you can get it for anything. There are no restrictions on what medical marijuana uh, can be recommended for. Uh, but you often really don't know what you're getting. You don't know the purity, you don't actually know what's in it. Has it been grown with pesticides? What other toxins might be involved? It's a big issue, although California did just pass a law to actually track now medical marijuana farm to table, so to speak. Uh, and it's very likely that when recreational marijuana becomes actively legal on January 1st of 2018, the same thing will occur. But one of the issues, because it's Schedule 1 and it's not regulated, you, you don't really know what dose do I use? Um, how often do I use it? What are the possible effects or what are the possible side effects? With FDA approved medications, there have been studies to show all that. I would add, by the way, that almost all research for, for medical marijuana in this country has to use federally approved medical marijuana. There's one site, which is the University of Mississippi, which has the marijuana farm. And by and large, that marijuana is still the same uh, marijuana from the 1970s, with a THC content of about 4%. We now know marijuana currently, by and large, is about 15 to 16% THC, about four times more. So those results are based on a very different strain of marijuana or dosing than what we, we currently is out there, which brings up a lot of other issues. But that's how the federal government is currently working. Now, one of the first medical indications was for glaucoma. Have you heard of this, anyone? So this, was, this sort of got it going. It, it treats glaucoma. Uh, and so there were some studies about 40 years ago that showed that smoking it or putting it, or using it orally or intravenously, interesting, not topically. They didn't have the preparations back then. You think it might make sense, you got an eye problem, put it in your eye. And anyway, it did help short term glaucoma. Um, but over the course of time, it actually showed it didn't help, ultimately, with the long term course of the disease. Plus, because marijuana can lower blood pressure, it actually could cancel out the effects of, of using it for uh, helping with intraocular pressure. And actually, three years ago, the American Academy of Ophthalmology looked at all the studies and said, actually, they do not recommend medical marijuana for glaucoma. So it's been an interesting process. Now, if you look out there, but what is medical marijuana being used for, or different research studies, there are lots of different issues here. Cancer. Will it help cancer? Can it cure cancer? Uh, we know that cannabinoids, you may have been to some other talks here which mention this, but cannabinoids uh, are, are internal cannabinoids. They're CB1, CB2. CB1's in our brain and nervous system, and CB2 is in our immune system could help potentially with the autoimmune disorders. Inflammatory bowel disease is, is considered an autoimmune disease. Could it help with ADD, sleep problems, depression, and, and anxiety? Now, if you go online, you will see many anecdotal testimonies as to the benefits of medical marijuana in adults for these conditions. Now, um, however, there's been no formal research conducted. So, it's at this point just anecdotal. Now, do we believe anecdotal? Sure, I mean, if someone tells me that they took a medication and it helped their condition, I'm not gonna deny as a physician that you're wrong, it didn't help you. But does that mean it's gonna help other people? Or um, is it, you know, we just don't know. Now, I'm a pediatrician, an adolescent medicine specialist, so I often get parents asking me to recommend medical marijuana 
for their children for a variety of conditions. And I have a lot of teenagers who want me to recommend it for them <laughs> as well. And I, I would add, by the way, that it often comes up because these teenagers are smoking marijuana recreationally. And they, they, their anecdotal statement is, oh, it helped me sleep better. It helped me with my pain. Um, I can do better in school now, and so on. And the parents say to me when the kid discusses it with them, oh, well, my kid said it, you know, help me with this, so please recommend it. Now, and we can talk about this later, I would add that, that very often they have not tried all the usual standard treatments, uh, including non-medical, uh, which I think is important. At any rate, Again, you go online, you're going to see a lot of testimonials that it's helped with all these, these things in children. But there are, there are no randomized controlled studies on the use of medical marijuana in children or adolescent populations. So as a physician, it's very difficult for me to recommend medical marijuana for children and teenagers when there's no evidence to say really it helps, and I would add that, again, I don't know what the dose would be. I don't know the purity. I'm not sure, uh, is it THC? Is it CBD? What are we really talking about? Is it some combination of that? And so again, we need a lot more research on this and rescheduling. Now, there is, a, there is a, currently a, a multi-center study going on on the use of cannabidiol, CBD, for intractable seizures in children because there is some evidence that CBD is a neurostabilizer. Uh, and actually in Israel, there's a study going on to look at CBD for the treatment of autism. It will help autism. We're gonna have, these will probably be uh, published in two or three years, and I think we'll have some interesting data on that. But this is it for formal research in children and adolescents at this point. Now, we know that medical marijuana can have side effects. And like any other medication, there's a specific indication that adults should be using it for, right? Um, I'm recommending it for whatever the condition is that you've got. Um, but children should really not have access to it. Um, and uh, in Colorado, we're our wonderful, beautiful state here, there's been a, a big increase in accidental overdoses of medical marijuana in children because often the medical marijuana is edibles or drinkables, it's soda, it's juice, it's brownies, it's cookies, it's gummies. Kids see it on the table, toddlers, and they accidentally ingest it. The parents are not intentionally wanting this to happen, but they end up in the ER or the ICU uh, because of overdose. Fortunately, there have been no deaths, but certainly want to avoid accidental overdose and ingestion in kids. And these are some of the serious conditions that can occur. Now, we do know, there's good data, this is true not just of marijuana, but tobacco, alcohol, and virtually every drug, that the younger someone starts using it, the more likely they are to develop problem use. Some of you may be familiar with the DSM-5. The DSM is the psychiatry bible of, of mental health diagnoses, and including substance use. The DSM-5 got rid of the word addiction. And what they now talk about is problem use. And every drug has problem use, and it's depending, there are 11 criteria that are basically the same for every drug. And you can have mild, moderate, or severe problem use, depending on how many of these criteria you meet. The one drug that is not included in problem use, which I'm glad about, is caffeine. <laughs> but there's tobacco problem use, marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, etc. But we do know that the younger a person does start using, the more likely they will develop problem use. Or I, I still like the word addiction, because marijuana can be addictive. Um, and we, we know there's been a lot of great research on adolescent brain development. And we now know that the adolescent brain <coughs> continues to develop into the early to mid-twenties. And one of the last parts of the brain to develop is called the prefrontal cortex. 
And the prefrontal cortex is responsible for impulse control and executive function. And again, that doesn't finish till you're done, you know, with your early to mid twenties. I think that actually explains a lot of that young adult behavior. They don't have yet the full impulse control and executive function. Um, now, we know if you start using at 14, you're much more likely to develop problem use than at 16, than 18, than 21. And what's very interesting about this brain development issue and drug use is that there seem to be two thresholds. If you wait to use drugs, alcohol, uh, till 18, so you, you're much less likely to develop problem use. And if you wait till 21, it's rare that you'll develop problem use. It's not unheard of, but these seem to be two cut points. So from my perspective as a pediatrician, I really want kids to put off their drug use starting till they're 18 at least, even better 21, because if they start before then, they're gonna potentially develop problem use. So, um, what we do know too, and there are good studies now to show this, and uh, there's not only psychosocial studies to look at how are you functioning out in the world, or cognitive studies, how's your brain doing uh, with that, um, but they're functional MRI studies, so very uh, uh, basic research that show if you use drugs, it alters the developing brain. Now, it's not exactly clear completely uh, how this development differs, but we do know that if you do develop problem use, that it's an issue. Um, so, much better to not use drugs and alter this normal brain development. So, this, the uh, CDC, with monitoring the future, defines what's called regular use and heavy use. Regular use is using 10 to 19 times a month. Heavy use is 20 or more times a month, which of course would include daily use. These kids are particularly at risk of developing problem use or addiction. And again, there can be cognitive, psychosocial, mental, mental health consequences. One of the problems is, if you're a current user, remember that was defined as using at least once in the past 30 days. We don't know who's going to go on to regular or heavy use. We cannot predict. If you have a, a family history of problem use, so if you have a, a family member who's an alcoholic or a drug addict, yeah, your, your, your kid is more likely to develop alcoholism or drug addiction. Other than that, though, and, and that, by the way, that's not definite, but it's certainly, we don't, it's, it's, it's possible. Other than that, we don't know which of these teenagers are going to develop problem use, which is, again, why we want to intervene early, prevention, early intervention. Um, so prevention, early intervention strategies are key to preventing a substance use disorder. Now, what does this mean in terms of regular and heavy use? So I guess on one hand, the good news is if you're not one of these users, so you use occasionally. Let's say you smoke marijuana on the weekend. If you can keep it to that, you'll probably be okay. But again, we're not sure which one of those will keep it to that sporadic or occasional use. Now, another big issue is what's called dual diagnosis. It's also called co-occurring diagnosis, COD. They're, those are similar terms. And this is from NISDA, but the young adults have the highest rates of dual diagnosis or co-occurring disorders. So if you have a substance use disorder, in between, this is ages 18 to 25 again, more than one in four have a substance use disorder in any mental illness. And if you have a serious mental illness, it's one in three almost. Now, what this means really is in sometimes what's first, you have a serious mental health issue and you're using a drug to, to treat yourself. We call it self-medication. Actually, that's pretty common. 
Or do you use the drug and then you develop a mental health disorder like depression, anxiety, or more psychosis? It's a little hard to know. Um, we think probably it goes both ways. That some teenagers or young adults who have mental illness use drugs to self-medicate, but we also know that some young adults who uh, start using drugs then develop serious mental health disorders. Now, one of the other issues that's important for teenagers is who do you hang out with? Because if your best friend uses or you're in a peer group that's using, you're at much higher risk of using and developing problem use. So again, as a pediatrician and as a parent, I want parents to, to be involved with who their kids are hanging out with, who their peer group is, what's going on, uh, because that's extremely important if you're going to go one path of health, being healthy, or another path of, of having problems. Now, we often hear, uh, and this is promoted by a lot of, of the antis, I'll say, of, of marijuana, and since that's what we're talking about primarily here, Marijuana is a gateway drug. Uh, and we've heard our attor current attorney general talk about this. Um, I won't mention his name. Um, uh, now, the reality is that there's very weak evidence that marijuana is a gateway drug, which is good. Um, the vast majority of soft drugs, and, and by the way, the three soft drugs are listed here, alcohol, marijuana, tobacco. The vast majority of these users do not go on quote, hard drug use. That would be opioids, amphetamines, cocaine, et cetera. So, why, so why, why is this? Well, soft drugs are easy to get. Um, I was walking around here, and within literally about four blocks, there's some marijuana dispensaries, more than one. There are a bunch, there's some um, you know, liquor stores. Uh, the convenience stores that sell cigarettes and vapes. So it's, it's all out there, very easy to get. Um, and that's one of the reasons, and by the way, when we talk about public policy with marijuana legalization, this is a big issue. How many dispensaries are you gonna have and how, how, how close are they gonna be to schools and how are you gonna advertise marijuana? Um, I live in San Francisco, that when you cross the, the Golden Gate Bridge, there's there's this huge billboard that um, goes, welcome to high California. <laughs> and um, I have a, a colleague who's 13 year old kid, are, are they saying hi? <laughs> no, this was like, let's get high California. Um, so advertising how that's gonna shake out, is, uh, these are big issues. Now, THC as I mentioned, Back in the 70s, it was about 4%. Uh, now it's about 16% on average, THC being, of course, the psychoactive uh, cannabinoid. Um, and so that can mean that uh, we might think, okay, in, in, the, in my days, you'd smoke a whole joint to get high. Now you can have one or two hits, right? That's because it's four times the dose. But um, if you're naive and you're starting to expose yourself rather than 4% to 16%, it may be easier to develop adverse effects if you do too much. Um, and there's some concern that because of the higher potency, you're more likely to get addicted sooner. Now, um, as we know, marijuana is illegal federally. Um, but there, there's some good evidence that if teenagers perceive there's less harm to whatever the drug is, they're more likely to consider use it, using it or use it. Um, and I've talked about the advertising here. Um, and again, decrease in perceived risk means you're more likely to potentially experiment and use it. Now, marijuana can be addictive. There's a myth out there that it's not but particularly among adolescents and teenagers, back to the developing brain issue, um, we know that about 9% of adolescents, if you start using before the age of 18, will develop addiction. 
and it could go up to 17% and the daily use is almost half. Now, the good news about marijuana addiction is that it tends to, it's one of the only drugs that tends to not be lifelong. If you look at those who are addicted, who are in their mid-teens, the majority of them by their late 20s are no longer addicted, which is great. However, they've lost 10 years of their life with psychosocial and cognitive issues that prevents them from really leading a healthy life, working, going to school, and so on during those 10 years. So it, it really is an issue. Now, we're going to finish up here with the counseling tips. Now, this is a paper, and it's in your handout. And if you go, I would say that if you, I uh, was on the American Academy of Pediatrics National Committee on Substance Use and Prevention. Uh, if you go to aap.org slash marijuana, the paper we recently published in March of this year, it's called a clinical report, which has all these counseling tips and um, data uh, to support it, is on that website. There's lots of other very interesting and useful, I think, for parents, for teens, for professionals uh, to learn more. So aap.org slash marijuana. And it's all free. You don't have to be a member to, to, to access these. Now, I have a lot of parents who come to me and say, hey, I smoke pot, or I smoke pot, and I, I'm fine. Um, so what's the big deal? And I did it when I was a teenager, or like in college, whatever. So why should, what's wrong with my kid doing it? Well, again, back to what we were talking about, that's great that you're fine. Um, but, and it may be benign for you, but it's not necessarily benign for your kid. Your brain's done. Uh, mine's done. Uh, you want all you, all you can get. And if you're dealing with a developing brain, and we know use of marijuana may cause abnormal brain development, we shouldn't mess around with this. So if something that's benign for you as an adult is not necessarily benign for an adolescent. I think that's a very important point. And back to regular use, you may develop mental health disorders. It's, there's definite good research on this, including addiction, depression, and psychosis are correlated with this. Another counseling point, number three, because there's no research on this, as I discussed, if you're using it for medical purposes, well, it's going to be trial and error completely. Um, and there can be side effects. Uh, and it's, this is a big issue. We don't know dosing. Um, we don't know CBD, THC ratios, what's going to help, what's not. Do you use one, do you use the other, and both, and so on. Um, I would add, by the way, that m m many of you may know this, but there are two major types of marijuana that are generally used, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Sativa tends to give you what's called a uh, an activated high, uh, whereas indica tends to give you the more relaxed, lethargic high. One of my patients helped me remember which is which. She goes, if it's indica, it means you're in the couch. Uh, um, now, most marijuana strains these days are hybrids of both sativa and indica. Although, you can certainly get one or the other. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that one of the, 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 the uh, strains that's, that's highly touted is called Blue Dream. It's from California. And a lot of these apps, by the way, have um, Yelp ratings like Yelp. And uh, I'll get into this more in a minute. but. Um, uh, <coughs> Everyone seems to love Blue Dream, activating. <laughs> All right. Um, now, this, this again, so this is both parents and teens, and this is also, again, both parents and teens. So I go over these points in the office with them. It is illegal. People often aren't sure. State laws vary. You've got to know your own state law. 
But for recreational, in all the states where it is legal, you gotta be 21 or over. To me, this is a, a big issue and a social justice issue because if you're 18 or 19 or 20, you can be caught, it's criminal, it's a big problem. Um, but they need to know that if you're caught and you're under 21, it, it could be serious. Now, I have a big issue, uh, well, often parents will tell me, kids will tell me, definitely they know don't drive under the influence of alcohol. Drunk driving is bad. But actually, driving under the influence of marijuana is good. Because, you know, the, 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 the thing I hear my patients tell me, if, if you drive under the influence of alcohol, you go through the stop sign. If you are under the influence of marijuana, you wait for the light to turn green at the stop sign. <laughs> um, so, um, but we now know from good data that actually marijuana is the, next to alcohol, is the number two drug that's involved with, with serious car accidents and fatalities. Um, so, again, I'll have parents who tell me, why drive under the influence? I'm careful, I'm safe. I'm not really sure that's true, but just because, again, you do, your kid should never drive under the influence or really drive with anyone who is. There are 30,000 fatal motor vehicle accidents in this country every year, all preventable. I'm talking about under the influence of alcohol and drugs. 10,000 of those are adolescents. And, you know, it's to me very sad that 10,000 kids die every year from the influence of, of alcohol and marijuana. Now, um, there's also a myth out there that if I use a bong, it's what we used to call in the old days, <laughs> um, uh, or that, that, that takes out the toxins. Well, that's not true. Anything you burn, well, doesn't matter, but cigarettes, marijuana, joints, whatever, you're, when you light a match and burn something, it heats it up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, to just use a round number. When you burn something, it creates smoke, tar, toxins. Doesn't matter what it is. The supposed benefit of vaping, uh, of using a vaporizer, is that you actually heat it to what's called its vapor point, which is about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And what you produce through vaporization is just water and the product you want for marijuana, THC, for tobacco, for cigarettes, it's nicotine. Um, and supposedly there are not these toxins. Now I would add that a lot of the vape stuff, it actually does have toxins in it. There have been studies to show that, uh, and a lot of it's made in China where um, quality control is, is not that good. Um, theoretically, it could be a good harm reduction, but uh, um, Use of vaporizers or hookahs does not eliminate toxins in smoke. Now, Sorry. that's a good question. Would you say there's a difference between um, vaporizing of the actual plant material versus vaporizing of like a, a liquid? So the question is, might there be a difference if you're vaporizing the actual plant material versus the liquid? And the likely answer to that is yes. That if you're actually using the pure plant material, you're likely not getting those toxins. However, what's in the plant material? I mean, how was it grown? Was it grown with pesticides? Uh, we know a lot of marijuana is grown with, that way. And if you vape that, you're going to get some of those chemicals as well. But say if it's organic vegan, uh, which is now a, a niche market in California, uh, maybe that's better. Uh, now, um, there are four uh, tips here just for parents. So these I discuss with parents, not with the, my adolescent patients. One is role modeling. Uh, parents often tell me, well, I smoke pot, but I tell my kid not to. Uh, and I smoke in front of my kid, or they know I smoke, but role, actions speak louder than words when it comes to teenagers and young adults, and so what you do is extremely important. And if you use and you tell your kid not to, they're gonna likely to use, period. Um, we talked about the, the keeping the products away. 
Um, even for adolescents, they may see the soda there, the brownie, whatever it is, not realize that they're gonna get high and be in a situation then that could be dangerous. Um, and parents, um, uh, and I, unfortunately I do come across this, parents who are using marijuana, and it's actually impairing their parenting. Now, does that happen to every parent? No, sure, it does not. But again, I do come across parents where, and they're, and I'll have actually teens who are worried about their parents' use, who are not using. And the parents think they're fine. And the teen realizes their parent is off. Big problem, we gotta let parents know, you, 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 you may think, oh, I'm fine, I'm wonderful, I'm happy, I'm this and that, but it may affect their parenting, and they really gotta be conscious and aware of this. Now, uh, finally, this last point, I get from parents a lot, I don't wanna lie to my kids about my drug use, about my marijuana use, so um, how, sh you know, how should I talk with them about it? So, what seems to work best is actually just using a brief, honest answer. Now, I compare this to talking with kids about sex. It's a very similar issue. Parents should talk with their kids about sex. Uh, safe sex, uh, you know, whatever the family values are, I think it's important to talk about them. But regardless, you don't tell your teenagers all about your sex life. You don't go into your intimate sexual practices and what's going on when you're having sex. And as a matter of fact, your teenagers actually don't want to hear it. <laughs> they will actually be grossed out about it. The last thing a teenager wants to think about is mom and dad having sex. That's not their thing, I can assure you. Drugs are very similar. They don't really want to hear about all your drug stories. It's just not that interesting to them. It's not that useful. Um, and so you can say, yeah, I smoke pot or, um, Maybe I still smoke pot, but I, I do it safely, I do it sporadically. It really, it's fine to acknowledge that you use, um, but what you're really wanting to do is open, a discussion, open up a discussion about marijuana use or other drug use. That's really what this is all about, and what's safe use, what's not. And again, back to the brain development issue, you really want to encourage your kid to not use regularly. Um, or not use at all because of the potential for regular or heavy use that they may get into. Now, in sum, and then we'll have a little time for questions here, recreational use should be discouraged in adolescents because of the brain development issues, mental health, cognitive, psychosocial, adverse problems. We have no Sadly, research on the use of medical marijuana in the pediatric and adolescent population. We don't know things about purity and dosing and so on. The data to date are reassuring that in medical marijuana states and even in recreational states so far, youth use rates are not going up. Now it is true that in the medical marijuana states, youth use rates were higher to begin with. But they're not increasing. But as um, we heard in another talk at the, at the summit here, legalization has literally been where we have data where it's been active is two or three years of data. And often these trends are, are a decade. So yeah, it's reassuring right now, but we need to look at five, 10 more years of data to really see what's gonna happen. And we need to really focus, I think, on prevention and early intervention. And it's very hard to recommend um, medical marijuana in the pediatric population because we just don't have the research. So I have a bunch of references for you. Um, and there are a bunch of good resources here as well for parents, for teens, for you. You can look at those. And who knows uh, Leafly? Um, I have Leafly. Um, on, on my phone, it's a great app. It's all things marijuana, and, and um, there are many marijuana apps out there. Now, when I signed on to Leafly, 
it said click a box that you're uh, of legal age to access this. Well, I happen to be, <laughs> but they didn't ask for my ID or any other info. And I can tell you the teenagers know all these apps. Parents often don't. Leafly has a YouTube uh, channel. Um, you know, a lot of these apps, uh, and by the way, Leafly has tons of ratings. Like uh, Blue Dream that I mentioned, they have over 7,000 user ratings. They have the latest news on marijuana. The, they have all the different strains. Um, so on the one hand, it's cool. You can learn a lot, but again, it's, it's like Yelp. If you believe it, great. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's anecdotal, let's put it that way, for most of it. But know that you're, you're, the, if you're working with youth, they're way into all this and know all this. But the parents probably know very little or nothing about it. So that's another important thing to educate parents about. That youth are into social media. <laughs> uh, and they're much more sophisticated about it than we are. So I will stop there and thank you and see if you have any questions. Yes? Why do you think that um, the kids who are smoking get addicted by their kind of their twenties, I believe you said, or late twenties, they're not even more like some other drugs? Why uh, so the question is, why do we think that marijuana addiction tends to uh, not be lifelong, and that kids who start in their teens tend in their same mid to late 20s. Um, we don't really know the, the answer to that, but we think that um, it just tends to, when you're into, you're into the mid to late 20s, you're, uh, that with marijuana, the use rates tend to go down, and your sort of life goals tend to be more uh, present. And the, there seems to be a realization that if I keep on using like this, I'm just gonna not get where I wanna be. Um, but it's a great question. We don't have a lot of data about that. Yes? Any resources for vaping kids? Like uh, to educate kids about them? Because like you said, they're getting it if we don't give it to them. Yeah, so the question is, are there resources about the vaping pens? And on that aap.org slash marijuana, you can find some there about the whole vaping uh, issue and vaping pens. Yes? I'm curious about, about your, your statements about the gateway effect. And, and here's, here's what gets confusing. So I'm from Ohio. We have an enormously bad opiate problem. I do a drug-free community um, TFC grant, so we're doing, trying to do primary prevention with our 18 and under. When you look at our data, clearly the problem with our youth is alcohol and marijuana, but I can't get anyone to talk about that because all anyone wants to talk about is heroin, which again, data-wise, we're not seeing in our younger population. Our, our kids are being affected by their parents or older. But we also, I'm affiliated with a treatment facility. And in the treatment facility, we, we have lots of people in treatment. I anecdotally have talked to a lot of recovering heroin addicts. And when I ask them, how did you get here? Almost ever, not a single one of them ever says that they didn't start out with alcohol and marijuana. So is it is it just that maybe it was early use and that led to addiction and then their addiction just kept getting worse? Or, you know, that's, that's what's confusing to me. And well, it's confusing because we're just trying to tell kids, you just don't want to mess with this stuff because you don't know where it'll lead you. Not necessarily that it's a gateway. Right, so the question is about uh, use of marijuana and, and is it uh, a gateway drug or how does it influence um, the development of more, quote, hard drug use? So it is true that it's extremely rare that harder drug users did not start out with alcohol or tobacco or marijuana, the three soft drugs that we talked about. But the reason why they really started out with those is because that's really what's out there pretty much every corner. Um, now, 
Why did they go on to heroin use? You know, there's probably some genetic and biological as well as social, psychosocial issues involved. But the reality is, is that if you look at rates of heroin use, they're, and obviously we don't want people using heroin. Um, and I would add, by the way, do you all know that heroin's a brand name? Yes? So heroin was actually, I got one minute, I think, to tell this story. You got four. I got four minutes. Um, so back in the 1880s, um, uh, there was a huge morphine epidemic in this country. And morphine was in everything. And if you look at ads back then, it cured everything. And it was, it was used for colic and babies. And just, it's really interesting to just go back and see that morphine was in everything. I called it sort of the snake oil. But, so Bear, the Bear Company had just invented aspirin. And aspirin is salicylic acid with an acetyl group called acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. Well, they had some leftover acetyl groups in the lab and morphine epidemic, huge problem. So they uh, decided to help with the morphine epidemic and put two acetyl groups on morphine, diacetylmorphine, and that's what heroin is. And they branded it as, as heroin and put it out there as this is a cure for the morphine epidemic. Uh, Anyways, that's a side sideline. <laughs> but back to what you're saying. Um, so um, the reality is, is that you know heroin obviously can be a huge problem. It, it's, it can be fatal. It's it's horribly addictive. Um, but the vast vast majority of those soft drug users just get, don't go on to use it. Yes. The, the way that I think of the concept of gateway is that anything that affects neural development, executive function, and impulse control might influence your high-risk behavior in the future. So whether it's adverse childhood experiences or early drug use can affect your executive function and you're more likely to be high-risk. So that's another way, that's a way of thinking about it. it yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, the gentleman was saying that um, with the effect of drug on neurodevelopment, whatever it can be, it, it can just make you more at risk for going on to use uh, hard drugs. And I think that that's, that's, that's certainly true. Yes, in the back. Yeah, so um, in the slide about counseling tips for parents, you mentioned not parents not giving really like detailed accounts of their own personal experiences. Would you say that if a parent had had like a, a bad, Reaction or experience that that would be okay or important to share with their child? Yes, I think so. The question was if a parent had bad a bad experience with marijuana use, would it be okay to share that? And again, I think that the answer would be yes. That oh, it, whatever it did caused me anxiety or I got paranoid or whatever it would be. But it, but I would keep it short and to the point. You don't have to go into every single detail about it. And again, your kid doesn't really want to hear every single detail about it. But to bring up that, yeah, I, I had a problem, and that's one of the reasons either I'm not using or I cut back or whatever it is, that can be useful. All right, thanks a lot, y'all.